Hello everyone, welcome to session four of LTEC 676. Quiet. I want to begin by thanking you for submitting and reflecting on your concept maps. I thought they were strong representations of the many concepts we've covered in the first few weeks of class. So well done. It is clear to me that you put some thought into organizing the big ideas of LTEC 676. Stepping back, we see similarities and differences in how the course material can be organized, categorized, and connected. So here they are, one by one. So there you have it, five beautiful concept maps. Again, this was a good strong start, and note that we'll be creating new concept maps at least two more times this semester. All right, let's move on. In this video, we're going to wrap up our first theme of the class, and we're going to do that by beginning to talk about some of the educational aspects of educational technology. But before we get there, I want to share with you a couple of important concepts from other readings that I think are relevant and important to getting at the true nature of technology. So the first idea comes from an article called Technology, the Emergence of a Hazardous Concept by Leo Marx. And in this article, Marx talks about this idea that technology's power defines an era. And he writes, It is now customary to single out the transformative power of technology as the defining characteristic of the era. To illustrate this point, he finds a quote from 1847 written by Daniel Webster. And that quote reads, It is an extraordinary era in which we live. It is altogether new. The world has seen nothing like it before. I will not pretend, no one can pretend, to discern the end, but everybody knows that the age is remarkable. And of course, those same sentiments could be said about today at the beginning of the 21st century. Another important concept that Marx talks about in his article is the idea of phantom objectivity. And he writes, in contemporary discourse, technologies are habitually represented by things. This distracts attention from the human, socioeconomic, and political relations which largely determine who uses these technologies and for what purposes. And of course, that relates to our nature of technology concepts, and I would ask all of you, is there a tendency for educators or the public to endow technologies with phantom objectivity? And if so, what is gained or lost by such a perspective? Now with that, I want to go over some of the technological belief systems that Shum touched upon in the computer savvy but technologically illiterate article we read last week. Now, I'm calling these belief systems. Others might refer to these as philosophies or perspectives, but I like the terminology belief systems. One of those belief systems is technological determinism. And this is the idea that technology is inevitable. Technological progress is an autonomous force outside of human control. And technological determinism sees technology as the primary factor shaping the course of history. Its impact on social change and cultural values is inevitable. In fact, the role of humans is merely to create increasingly complex technology until the technology reaches a point where it can actually reproduce on its own. In other words, technology has its own ends independent of humanity. Now, obviously, that's a very extreme belief system regarding technology. Now, we could contrast that with technological instrumentalism. Technological instrumentalism argues that technology is actually benign and neutral. It exists only to accomplish human ends. It doesn't have any ends of its own. Therefore, it is completely under the control of humanity, and it's entirely subservient to human purposes. The long and short of instrumentalism is that human history is shaped by humans and 
and not by technology. And a third important belief system regarding technology is technological fundamentalism. And this is the idea that technology's value is assumed and more or less unexamined. Its relation to larger purposes is never questioned. And fundamentalists argue that humans are unwilling or unable to question basic assumptions about how our tools relate to our larger purposes. In other words, we fail to ask hard questions about why we do what we do, how we do it, or how these things affect our long-term prospects. And David Orr, the originator of this particular belief system, argued that industrial societies are long on means, but short on ends. In other words, we're unable to, as a society, to separate what we can do from what we actually should do. And that's because of a fundamentalist belief system around technology. So those are three different technological belief systems that I think are important. And as Shum argues in her article, someone who's really technologically literate should be able to recognize and argue against these various belief systems. And with that, I'd actually like to turn to talking about educational technology. So what is educational technology? Well, one definition is it's the study and ethical practice of facilitating learning and improving performance by creating, using, and managing appropriate technological processes and resources. What I like about this definition is it underscores both the ends, facilitating learning and improving performance, as well as the means by creating, using, and managing appropriate technological processes and resources. So we've already talked about technology writ large, and we've learned that technology includes things, tools, machines, symbols, objects, and techniques, and all of the above. And we've also learned that all technologies are combinations of elements, and those elements themselves are actually technologies, and all of those technologies use different phenomena to some purpose. Now, broadly speaking, educational technologies fall into two categories, hard technologies and soft technologies. Examples of hard technologies can be physical things such as books, chalkboards, interactive whiteboards, tablets, virtual reality. Examples of soft technologies are processes or templates, and these might be instructional design models or certain standards such as shareable content objects or the Six Sigma process. So those are two ways of categorizing educational technologies. So how do schools typically use technology? Well, historically, schools have used technology in three ways. First, they've used technology for instructional preparation. That means teachers preparing materials, communicating or collaborating with peers, students and parents, locating digital resources, or creating lesson plans. Another way schools use technology is for instructional delivery. Teachers and students actually use the technology. Teachers might present instruction via projector or through slides, and students might use computers for drill and practice or for tutorials or simulations. Those are all examples of technology for instructional delivery. And finally, the third how centers on technology as a learning tool. And in this category, we can think about students using software and hardware to extend their abilities to solve problems, create products, or communicate and share their perspectives. So this is three big ways in which schools have traditionally used technology. Now, what are some of the ways that technology is in impacting all of education. Well, Bransford, Brown, and Cocking argue that there's actually five potential areas of impact. The first area is to bring new curricula to classrooms. The second area is to provide scaffolds and tools that enhance learning. The third area is to create opportunities for feedback, reflection, and revision. The fourth area is to build communities, and those can be local, national, or global. And the fifth area of impact is to expand teacher training. So if we were to summarize the ways technology are potentially impacting education, we could think about these five different areas of impact. As we read about in Shum's article, massive amounts of money have been spent on educational technology. So what are some of the underlying rationales for investing that kind of money? Well, a 2005 article by Culp, Honey, and Manadach argues that there are three rationales. 
One of the rationales is the idea of the challenge fixer. And this is the idea that there are certain challenges faced by education and that technology, if it's invested in enough, will address those challenges. It will fix them. So, for example, delivering instruction to geographically dispersed audiences. That's a challenge that technology might be able to address. Helping students collect and make sense of data, that's another challenge that might be fixed by or addressed by technology. And the need to support more diverse forms of communication. We could think here of diversity, inclusivity, and ideas of trying to help everyone communicate around teaching and learning. That's another challenge that education has faced and technology might be able to fix that. The second rationale is the change agent rationale. This is the idea that technology is going to trigger changes in education itself. For example, it might trigger changes away from lecture-driven instruction and toward more constructivist, inquiry-oriented approaches to teaching and learning. That would be an example of a fundamental change in the way education is practiced. Another example would be transformative potential. Digital tools may change the learning environment and the teaching process, making it more flexible and more challenging for students. The third rationale for investing in educational technology is the economic competitiveness rationale. And this has to do with the idea that technology is transforming society and is having a huge impact on national economies. Therefore, technology skills are key to national economic and political growth and development. The ability to expect and adapt to change is fundamental to success in the job market and to active citizenship. And for that reason, we should be investing in technology. It should become part of our school system to make our nation more economically competitive. So there you have it, three rationales for the investment in educational technology. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for now. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.